We have some members in our church who work for Pioneer Bible Translators. It's an organization that translates the Bible into other languages and cultures throughout the world. In 1998, they were working in West Africa, and they actually took a trip to a neighboring country to get some dental work done. They stayed a few extra days to visit a camp and to talk with some of their friends. They even went and visited a waterfall, and one of the friends that went with them to the waterfall was visiting. It was a couple visiting from the United States, and they even had their toddler and their newborn baby with them. When they got back from the waterfall to their car, an attacker jumped out to rob them, shooting an assault rifle into the air. And suddenly he came up at them and began to yell and command, lie down, lie down. He was yelling in French, his language. One of the couples, the couple from the United States, did not understand the orders and so did not comply. He remained standing. And so the attacker pointed the gun and fired point blank in his chest. He shot. And they're thinking he's dead. But he looked down at his chest. Nothing. Soon after that, another attacker came out from the bush and began to rummage through their vehicle and their stuff to steal their stuff from them. The first attacker was holding them at gunpoint a little up the path. And at one point, he became frustrated and pointed the gun at the back of one of the women and pulled the trigger. She felt the air on her back. But again, nothing happened. And so after these two shots, they're thinking, he's got blanks in this gun. And their minds started racing about what they could do. The second guy at the car started hauling off their gear out of their car, their computers, their critical supplies, and he's making off down the road with their things. And they saw an opportunity because he did not have a getaway vehicle. Thinking that he had blanks in his gun, three of the missionaries, the guys, they got up and pursued the attackers to clash with them, one of them was so full of adrenaline, it was the guy from the United States, he forgot he had his newborn baby in the carrier on his chest. And they clashed with the attackers, those that were still down the road watched, they heard three more shots go off, their hearts jumped into their throats. But sure enough, several minutes later, the missionaries returned with all of their gear, including the baby's diaper bag. And they also had the gun. They had taken it off of the attackers before they ran off. The group immediately went to the police station to report the incident, and when they got there, they handed the gun over to the policeman and told them that they thought there were blanks in the gun. The policeman opened up the, the gun, looked inside of the magazine. It was full of live ammunition. And the police officer said, you thought there were blanks in this gun? We don't even have blanks in this country. What would we do with blanks in this country? And he said, no, my friend. God exists. Guys, that's just one of countless stories of God's Spirit defending, protecting, and empowering His people for the kingdom of God throughout the world. And when that couple tells this story, they end it like this, these words. They say this, God has not promised me that He will always deliver me miraculously, but He has promised that he is with me. So even if next time the bullets work, because they didn't work that time, but even if next time the bullets work, look at this boldness, he has promised he is still with me. Incredible boldness, incredible courage. What if we told more stories like that? Maybe you feel like, I don't have any great personal stories, but just listening to that story, did that light you up and set a fire in your heart just a little bit? I want to welcome you this morning to Compass Christian Church. My name is Luke Davidson. I'm the campus pastor with our North Richland Hills campus, and our church's mission, your mission, is navigating people to God. We're one church in thousands of locations. Wherever you're watching from this morning, please let us know in the comments. We would love to connect with you. Maybe you're at home, maybe you're on vacation, maybe you're in the hospital, maybe you're at work, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You know, I'm really excited because next weekend, we are going to resume in-person services. And I want you to be a part of that if you are comfortable coming and being a part of our in-person services. Of course, we're gonna continue everything that we've been doing here online, but we're also going to resume our in-person services. We are going to follow the statewide mandates for masks and social distancing. We are approaching this with an abundance of caution. 
But we felt like going back into the fall and with schools starting to talk about getting back together, that we would do so as well. So please join us next weekend in person if you feel comfortable to do that. But before we look too far ahead, I just wanna look back over the past few months. I'm so proud of our church. I'm so proud of you and the impact that we've made in our community, loving our community through crisis and difficult times. I'm so proud of you. Today, I wanna to finish this series that we've been in called Holy Ghost Stories. If you missed the last few weeks, we've been searching through this concept of who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Ghost? If you grew up in church, maybe you didn't grow up in church at all, but if you did, you might've heard the preacher at some point talk about the Holy Ghost. Did you find that strange? Did that make you uncomfortable? And so we've been uh, talking about the Holy Ghost, and today I want to use this lantern to illustrate a few things. Specifically, what we talked about the last few weeks is that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, they felt really good. But we see countless times, again and again, where Jesus would go away to, to pray or to do something, leaving the disciples by themselves, and something would happen, and they would get scared, and things got really dark for them. But then Jesus would come back, and suddenly they felt a lot better, more confident and secure, and felt like they could do anything because Jesus could do anything. But then Jesus ascended into heaven, and they seem a little unsure again, a little unsure of what their next steps would be, and they kind of go into hiding again until the Holy Spirit of God comes upon them. And suddenly, they felt all of the things that they felt when Jesus was beside them, except Jesus wasn't beside them. Instead, the Spirit of Christ was within them. And what we've discovered is that the Holy Spirit inside you is even better. How could it be better? But it is even better than Jesus beside of you. It might sound crazy because when we talk about spirits, and ghost stories, like that stuff is scary. It's not comforting. So how could the Holy Ghost, how could the Holy Spirit be comforting and a good thing? Because ghost stories are scary. But I just want to say to you today from the outset, what if instead of ghost stories being something that we tell to terrorize and scare people, what if we started to tell Holy Ghost stories that empower and embolden people's faith? I have heard stories and Maybe you have too. I've heard stories of the way that God's spirit has worked through people and caused miracles and transformed people's lives. And when I hear those stories, when you hear those stories, those stories do not make me scared. They make me bold, courageous. They increase my faith. And I feel like there's nothing that my God cannot do. It reminds me of a time where two of Jesus's disciples named Peter and John. This was after Jesus had ascended. He's gone. After he had gone, Peter and John were heading into the city of Jerusalem and they heal, a miracle happens, they heal a man who had been paralyzed with severe disability so that he was not paralyzed anymore. A huge crowd gathered because of this miracle and Peter and John used this as an opportunity to tell the crowd about Jesus. You say, let me tell you in whose name this man was healed. It's Jesus Christ. Well, this got the attention of the religious leaders and authorities, the same people that killed Jesus, I'll remind you. They did not like this message. And so they arrest Peter and John. Verse 7 of Acts chapter 4, they questioned Peter and John. By what power and what name are you doing this? And then it says, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, like up to his eyeballs filled. And I want to remind you, this is the very same guy who weeks earlier, the night that Jesus was arrested, was Peter bold? Was Peter courageous? No, the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter was hiding, denying that he even knew Jesus. People are asking Peter, do you know Jesus? No, 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 no. What is different now? The Holy Spirit is empowering him, filling him, and he is incredibly bold, so bold that he says to this panel of the most powerful people in his country, look at what he says to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we, John and I, if we are being called to an account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, here's your answer, you and all the people of Israel 
And he puts a colon at the end there just to let him know he's about to lay into him and let him have it. He says, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, you killed him, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. And his buddy John went, boom, roasted, dropped the mic. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But this was a really incredible moment. It just goes off on this council. No fear. Because when you're not afraid of death, what's there to be afraid of? They already killed their leader, Jesus. He came back to life. And so they're thinking this kingdom that we're a part of, it's unstoppable. You can kill Jesus, it's not gonna stop it. You can persecute us, it's not gonna stop it. And for us today, so many things going on in our world, COVID-19, not going to stop the church, not going to stop the kingdom of God. And so the council is so taken back that someone would speak with such boldness. I mean, nobody talked to them this way. These guys have so much power. Nobody talks to them this way. And they're really shaken. Like, they don't know what to do with this guy. Verse 13 says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. These were disciple school dropouts. Nobody else wanted them to be their disciples. Jesus asked them to be their disciples. They say, these are unschooled, ordinary men, it says. And so this group of leaders, it says they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So what's different about these guys? They had been with Jesus, which is fascinating because they had seen disciples like Peter and John of Jesus. They had seen Jesus' disciples before Jesus would be away and they would be scared and in hiding. I mean, when they arrested Jesus, they couldn't find the disciples anywhere because they were scared and they were hiding. Now, Jesus is gone, but their faith is on fire and they're more bold than they have ever been before and courageous. Or some might say stupid. I'm sure there were people in that courtroom in front of all those leaders in that panel who thought, you guys are dumb. They killed Jesus. Now you're talking about Jesus. They're going to kill you too, dummy. Or maybe you think about all the wealth and the power represented in that leader council. And you're maybe, maybe you're a consultant and you're thinking, Peter and John, you guys are missing a huge opportunity right now. Like you could leverage the crowds that are following you. You could leverage all of the marketing and you could use that to make yourself rich. These guys would pay you handsomely, buy you off and you could invest in the crowds. You could, you could lead this whole movement. You could, you could become so powerful. Why would you throw that all away for this message about a dead man coming back to life? But Peter and John, we're not gonna sell out on this message of what they had seen and heard. Plus, they knew that the results, the reward in heaven from God would be much greater than anything in that panel could ever, anyone in that panel could ever give to them. And in their minds, and in your minds, I want you to understand, God's wealth and his abilities and his resources or whatever that might be far outweighs anything else that's vying for your attention and devotion right now. There might be certain things in your life that you feel tempted or distracted and say, well, God wants me to do this, but... I'd rather do this, it's a, it's a more significant investment, I'll make more money, or this is a better use of my time. I'm telling you, that's not true. Do not be swayed by things that wanna distract you from the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. The rewards are much greater when you follow through with what God wants for you. The reality is, we are all going to feel really dumb if you live your life without walking in step with the Holy Spirit and his courage. You will get to the end of your life and you will probably feel like you lived a pretty meaningless life because all the things that you thought mattered just don't matter anymore. And you realize you can't take it with you when your life ends. And that leads me to the afterlife. If you get to the afterlife and you mess out on that, you talk about a waste of time. Those are definitely not the results that you want. So live a life and step with the Spirit of God and let your faith be on fire, filled with the Holy Spirit. I ran across this quote from Hunter S. Thompson. He said, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body. <laughs> and for the sake of my message today, I just wanna change that first word if you'll allow me to. I'd love to change that first word to faith. Faith, 
should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. I hear people all the time that talk about, you know, my faith is personal, it's private, it's comfortable. What if your faith was on fire? What if every single day was a new adventure? Staying in step with the Holy Spirit and where he's leading you to. All sorts of incredible stories that would come out of it. That's the way that Peter and John lived their life. And he said it was absolutely worth it because they knew they were being rewarded in this life and in the life to come. That council didn't know what to do with them because the guy that was healed is standing right next to them and the crowds are with these guys. They'd already tried to kill Jesus. That didn't, that didn't help. The movement just grew all the more. So like, what are we gonna do with these guys? If we kill them, it's just gonna spread even more. Let's give them a verbal reprimand, they say. <laughs> Stop talking about Jesus. And you'd think Peter and John would say, hey, whoo, we got away with it. Let's get out of here before they change their minds. But Peter's like, nah. I'm going to lay into them some more. They don't tell me what to do. I only follow orders from God. Look at what he says. Verse 19 and 20. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to listen to him, to listen to God. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. I just want to take a second to say, I don't know what you believe about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe you think that happened. Maybe you think there's no way that could happen. Whatever you feel about that, here's the stone cold fact that you have to reckon with. It is a fact that 2000 years ago, there were guys that stood in front of power like this and refused to back down. And each and every one of them went to their graves and were persecuted and sometimes killed for telling the story that Jesus had been killed and then came back to life. Why would you do that if it was a lie? And so you have to reckon with this. These guys are saying, we cannot help but talk about what we have seen and what we have heard. And we're not scared, Peter and John are saying, because you killed our leader and God brought him back to life. Say you're sorry. You can't stop this. And the council knew that they were right. Verse 21 says, after further threats, they let him go. They could not decide how to punish them because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. And that's just one story. One story of many, where even after Jesus was gone, you'd think things would be dark, Jesus is gone. But Jesus is gone and his followers are more bold and more empowered than ever. And then I think about you and me and us. Nobody, nobody's following me around trying to write down, hey, I gotta, I gotta record this incredible story of unschooled courage that Luke has. Nobody's, nobody's following me around, and maybe they're doing that for you. And so I just wanna ask the question, why not us? Why not you? Why couldn't we live with a faith that's on fire and the presence of the Holy Spirit empowering us with incredible courage? Why not us? I'm gonna be a little tough on us today. I want to ask you a question. Are you courageous in your faith or are you comfortable? I'm not asking you to be stupid, but I am asking you to be strategic and to think through where God is calling you to. I'm not asking you to be irresponsible, but I am asking you to be resolved in your faith. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter five, verses 24 and 25, he says this, since we live by the Spirit, since the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in us and empowers us, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The idea of let, let's march with him, let's maintain the pace, let's keep step with the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, I was baptizing my new friend Larry and Larry's stepson was there. His name is Curtis. Curtis is a veteran. He was in Iraq. He was deployed there back in the day. And we were just kind of getting to know each other. I noticed he was a guy who works out. You could tell. 
I don't know if he noticed that about me, <laughs> probably not. But I was just asking him some questions, especially with it being so hot here in Texas in the summer, saying, you know, how are you working out? And he's saying, I've been running nine to 10 miles a few times a week. It's like, sheesh, that's pretty impressive, man. Wow. And then I got to thinking, you know, in the military, you probably had to run more. So I'm asking, you know, what did it look like to run and exercise in the military? And he says, well, it just depended. At one point he had an instructor uh, who, who was a marathon runner and they, they would run up to 20 miles pretty regularly. It's like, wow, that's impressive. And then he told me this, I couldn't believe it. He said, when he was in Iraq the first time, they had to do long marches pretty routinely because they didn't have supply lines. So if they didn't get to where they needed to go, they could run out of food, it'd be very, very dangerous. So he said, one time they marched 50 miles nonstop. <laughs> I was like, what? That's incredible. These guys are hoofing it. Talk about keeping in step. Why are they pushing it? Because they had a war to fight. They had a war to fight. And sometimes I think about you and I and what God has called us to and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. And I wonder if you've mistaken it. You, you thought that following Jesus was supposed to be this easy, posh life where everything has been given to you and it's easy and just God gives you everything you ever wanted. And you have not realized that he's actually calling us to a battle and to an adventure. Did you know that with the Holy Spirit, you can conquer, that's what you're supposed to do, conquer all of your struggles, your sin over your lifetime. You can conquer all of your addictions, your lusts, your gossip, the lies, the, the different, the angers that have dominated your life. You can conquer all of those things. We also know through the example of the apostles and other Christians throughout the centuries that the Holy Spirit will empower you to move and to knock down and flatten societal things that are broken. You wanna bring about reform and renewal? The Holy Spirit will empower you to do things that are not humanly possible and to transform them, not only in society, but within yourself. Did you know that with the Holy Spirit, you can actually be a parent that's sacrificial and you can break generational sin that's been passed down from your grandfather to your father to you. You can break it so that it's not passed on to your son or to your daughter. You can be a husband or a wife that you've always wanted to be. You can be the neighbor. You can change the world. In fact, that has happened again and again and again when people have lived in step with the Holy Spirit. But so many of us, we get in this boat, so to speak, and you think you're on a cruise ship. No, this is a battleship. It's time to fight. That's why Paul says in Galatians 5, 24 and 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, it's like the Holy Spirit is doing a 50 mile march because he's got a war to win. And we're 50 miles back in the lazy boy. Sometimes I'd like to take a message like this and soften it up, lower the bar a little bit, but I don't want to soften it up today. I want to, I want to tell you, you can do this. We can really walk in step with the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you today to start thinking about what is God leading me to do? What do I need to step into in my life? Oh, but I'm scared where the Holy Spirit might lead me. Listen, the Holy Spirit will never lead you somewhere that is not with your best interest at heart. It might be painful, not saying it's not gonna be difficult, it might take courage, but never, never stupidity. There is a spiritual battle happening for your life, whether you like it or not, it's happening. A battle for your life, for your marriage, for your kids, for your community, for your friends. Jesus set up his kingdom and empowered you with the Holy Spirit so that you can be victorious in this battle. So I don't want to hear, I can't keep up with the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can. Hear me saying today, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm trying to motivate you and say, you can keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, God has specifically equipped you with his spirit to empower you so that you can, you can be empowered to live the life and to stay in step with him. And you think, well, I'm not like Peter and John. I'm not like Jesus's disciples. Let's not overinflate those guys. Can I remind you that before they had the Holy Spirit, they were scared and timid, hiding when Jesus wasn't around, but then the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were bold and they were courageous and they were confident. You can be too. Tell the stories, the Holy Ghost stories. They will help give you faith and they will build up your courage. Stories like this. 
It was about a year and a half ago, there's a couple from our North Richland Hills campus whose child was born prematurely. And it was not looking good. The child was dying. The doctor just so happens to attend our church too, it attends a different campus. But the doctor told me later on that she was there trying to save that child's life and it was not looking good, the child was dying. But she felt the Holy Spirit lead her to begin praying, so she did. She said, I don't know how to explain it, but the child's vitals started to change. And here we are a year and a half later, that child is healthy, growing, and that doctor would tell you, the glory goes to God. The glory goes to God. One of my friends recently became a pastor, but for 10 years of his life, he was a severe alcoholic, arrested five times for intoxication. And he got fed up with it and he said, God, I need your help, I cannot do this, save me. And he came and he got baptized. I was there when he got baptized. He was shaking when he came. And I don't know how to explain this to you, but God took, God took his alcoholism away from him that day. Like he hasn't had a craving or a drink since. It's a miracle. And here we are a few years later, the guy is a pastor. You see how these Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost stories, they set our hearts on fire. Maybe you listening right now are starting to imagine what God could do in and through you. A few years ago, I took a trip to, to India and I was teaching about Jesus' resurrection to a group of students, giving them reasons to trust the resurrection happened. At the very end, 45 minutes later, one of the Bible college students says, hey Luke, what do I do if somebody rejects all of these reasons you just gave me? And I sort of kidding because I was like, I just gave you everything I've got, I've got nothing else. Spent 45 minutes trying to tell you this. I don't know if, if, if somebody's at that point. And I just sort of kidding, but also serious said, just pray for a miracle that God will change their heart. And suddenly my translator got really excited and he started saying a bunch of stuff in Hindi that I didn't understand and the, the, the crowd was nodding. They were definitely more excited about that than anything I had said for the past 45 minutes. And I said, what, what did you just tell them? He said, oh, I was just telling them about reminding them about praying for a miracle that God would change somebody's heart so that they would trust in Jesus. And, and what I was telling them, I was reminding them there was a Hindu village not far from here that was going through severe drought and famine so bad, got so dangerous, so desperate that the patriarch of the village decided to pray to Jesus instead of their other gods. And guess what? It rained and the whole village converted to Christianity. Whoa, <laughs> yeah, that'll work. And this kind of stuff doesn't have to be super big dramatic deals. One day I was going to lunch and I had a certain place in mind, but my buddy Brooks said, hey, let's pray and try to be in the spirit and step with the spirit, see where he wants us to go. And I'm praying and I'm thinking, you know what? Actually, I think God wants us to go get a brisket sandwich. Can I get an amen? Everybody wanna go <laughs> get a brisket sandwich? And so we went to the brisket place instead. And I kid you not, we were standing in line at the register and I go to this place all the time. I'm standing in line at the register. This guy comes up and he's just super transparent about his life. I don't know if he could tell that we were pastors, but then we told him and he said, man, I just am really struggling. And he started to show us pictures on his phone of his family. He's telling us all this stuff. I'm thinking, what's going on? 10 minutes later, this guy's talking about how he needs to get back in church. And it was just a really neat experience that I don't think I would have experienced if I had not been trying to pay attention to where the Holy Spirit was leading me. I wonder how much more often we would have experiences like that if we would just listen and stay in step with the Spirit. Some of you think this is so mystical and strange. I'm telling you, it could be as simple as you just praying, God, where should I go to lunch? God, where, where should I go today? What should I say in this moment? And just try to pay attention and follow through with it. Holy Ghost stories. I know that these things do not always result in miracles, but when they do, we should celebrate and we should tell the stories. It's not weird. It's awesome. And it encourages us, emboldens our faith, and gives us courage. It also reminds us that God has a purpose for us. He has a purpose for you. I want you to imagine right now who will be in heaven because you decided to stay in step with the Spirit. Who in your family, who among your friends, who among your coworkers? And also who will not be there because you chose not, you refused to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. I wanna ask you a question. What would you do right now if you were absolutely certain the Holy Spirit lives in you? What kind of stories would you have? And if you're not sure about that, reach out to us because we wanna help you start a journey filled with the Holy Spirit. It would change your whole life. 
write in the comments, fill out the connection card. We want to help you through this. Because I don't want to get to the end of my life. People say I worked on my own power. Now I want them to say there's no way Luke could have done that without the power of the Holy Spirit. I'd love to be more courageous. I bet you would too. Staying in step with the Holy Spirit is the way to do it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, please ignite us with your fire today. I pray that we would not be comfortable in our faith, but that we would be bold, emboldened by your Spirit. Thank you so much for giving us everything that we need to conquer all of our struggles in this life. I pray that we would be emboldened and that we would share these stories with our friends and we might even share these stories on our social media pages and tag our families just to encourage others. And I pray that over coffee, we would just ask people, what's your Holy Ghost story? Do you have any? And we would listen and be, and be lit up with passion and fire ourselves. I pray all of this in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.